Jeff Kahn founded the Media Watch Group Fair and co-founded Roots Action. He is a columnist, a former TV pundit, and author of Cable News Confidential, My Misadventures in Corporate Media. He has a new show on Free Speech TV called Just Solutions. And I also want to mention that you were, I believe, the producer for Phil uh, Donahue when he was on NBC and that whole story where they dumped the show when you were the number one rated show because they were talking about what we're talking about today. Anyway, Jeff, take it away. All right. Thanks so much, Frank. And I'm going to talk about the Phil Donahue censorship. Uh, thanks to the organizers of this event. I've learned an awful lot. Uh, today, progressives are valiantly fighting against racism and inequality in our country. But a lot of progressive groups never talk about US foreign policy. As my colleague David Swanson's always saying, they seem to be ignoring 96% of humanity. And I would argue that US, that racism is at least as devastating in US foreign policy as it is in US domestic policy. And that racism has been an underpinning of US foreign policy, certainly through the decades of the Cold War, which was allegedly a conflict between the United States and the Soviet Union, but few Russians were killed. Uh, while US foreign policy was massacring people of color, largely civilians from Southeast Asia to Southern Africa to Central America and beyond. Midway through the Cold War, Martin Luther King Jr. in April 67 came to New York City and did a speech at Riverside Church. It was not just a speech against the Vietnam War. Indeed, the speech was titled Beyond Vietnam. It was a criticism of the racist and imperial underpinnings of US foreign policy uh, during the Cold War. King said that the US was on the wrong side of a world revolution from Vietnam to South Africa to Latin America. King criticized what he called our alliance with the landed gentry of Latin America. He asked, why is the US suppressing revolutions of the shirtless and barefoot people of global South instead of supporting these revolutions. And then he commented, complaining of, quote, capitalists of the West investing huge sums of money in Asia, Africa, and South America, only to take the profits out with no concern for the social betterment of the countries, unquote. That speech is generally not allowed to be heard in mainstream media today. But it was heard loud and clear back in 1967 and it was a reflection of the Cold War hysteria in the US news media that so many liberal outlets denounced King's speech. The New York Times had an editorial denouncing the speech. The Washington Post patronized, quote, King has diminished his usefulness to his cause, his country, his people, unquote. <coughs> Life Magazine engaged in classic media red baiting when they referred to the speech as, quote, demagogic slander that sounded like a script for Radio Hanoi, unquote. Now, as soon as the Cold War started in the 1940s, it was accompanied by red baiting and the blacklist here in the US that deeply undermined US media and did so for many decades, including up to the 2003 when I was at MSNBC and was politically purged from my job alongside Phil Donahue. Overseas wars, whether they're hot wars or cold wars, have always led to repression and censorship here at home. Uh, the blacklist, of course, had a devastating impact on Hollywood. We heard from an earlier speaker, a devastating impact on unions and union activists. But it also had a devastating impact on the US news media, where reporters, editors, producers had to pledge loyalty against communism. George Clooney made an excellent movie celebrating Edward R. Murrow for having taken on 
the red baiting Senator Joe McCarthy late in 1953. But I've never seen a Hollywood movie about the US journalists that were red baited and purged, including friends of Edward R. Murrow that he did not defend and, and, new, and journalists at other outlets. Television remains a dominant medium in our country. And it was forged, it was birthed at the time of the Cold War and the blacklist. And that put a stamp on television and television news that has continued up through the present day. I founded the Media Watch Group Fair in 1986. And I immediately started having meetings with executives at television news, CNN, PBS, ABC News. And this was decades after the blacklist had ended. And with documentation, I went to these executives and I said, in your debates of the right versus the left, you have fire breathing right wingers like Pat Buchanan and Bob Novak, uh, but you don't allow any genuine leftist, even mild mannered leftist to appear with the fire breathing right wingers. Instead, the left is represented by these forever backpedaling, retreating, mealy mouth corporate Cold War liberals. And these executives knew what they were doing. Noam Chomsky, for example, was off limits at these TV news channels. Noam Chomsky, who appeared at that time and now in mainstream news outlets across the globe, on public television across the globe, except in the country where he lives and the country that he analyzes the most closely. At CNN, an executive tried to placate me by reminding me that he had once worked in a campaign that was led by Jim Hightower. And I had to point out to him, but you don't allow Jim Hightower or other genuine progressives to appear on CNN. When I was at ABC, I had this discussion with Ted Koppel where I said, FAIR's research has proven that if you're gonna be a US guest that discusses US foreign policy on Nightline, you have to have been someone with experience in the US foreign policy establishment. So I said, given that requirement, I'm wondering why have you never booked a Daniel Ellsberg as a guest? Because he was in the foreign policy establishment before he joined the peace movement. And Koppel's reaction was, I think Daniel Ellsberg is very brave. He shows a lot of courage, but he strikes me as something of an extremist. At which point I immediately responded that Fair's research had shown that extremism shouldn't bother you at all, Mr. Koppel. Your most frequent guests, the ones that appear over and over, are Elliot Abrams, Jerry Falwell, Patrick Buchanan, Al Haig, and Kissinger. Now, um, the Cold War continued to narrow the political spectrum. Uh, and who's allowed into the debate long after the Soviet Union collapsed. I could still feel the Cold War's impact in 2002 and 2003 when I was working at MSNBC run by NBC News and a new war against Iraq was being cranked up. And I was the senior producer as, as Frank said on the most watched program on MSNBC, the Phil Donahue primetime show. And I want to end my remarks by talking about what I witnessed during that period. One night we booked uh, Ramsey Clark, the former US Attorney General who talked eloquently against this push to invade Iraq. And the next morning, we learned from management how we had screwed up, that Ramsey Clark is not supposed to appear on MSNBC. Uh, this is nearly 50 years after Joe McCarthy, and there was some sort of blacklist that no one had told us about, and we'd made the mistake of booking Ramsey Clark. Management warned us repeatedly that Phil Donahue was coming across to viewers as un-American, and they actually used that word. As the Iraq invasion grew closer, 
management took over the Phil Donahue show and they imposed the quota system. They said, if we wanted to book one guest who was opposed to the push toward an invasion of Iraq, we had to have two guests that were pro-invasion. If we booked two guests on the left, we had to have three guests on the right. At one meeting, a producer said, I think I could book Michael Moore for Thursday. And Michael was known as a serious critic of the push toward invading Iraq. And the producer was told, you'll have to have three right wingers for ideological balance. I thought privately about proposing Noam Chomsky as a guest, but you can imagine the problem. Our stage couldn't accommodate the 28 right wingers we would have needed for ideological balance. 10 days after the biggest peace demonstrations in global history, MSNBC canceled the Donahue show for purely political reasons. Did management say, wow, look at the size of these demonstrations. If we unleash Phil Donahue, we're going to have a huge audience. No. For political reasons, they terminated our show. How do I know it was political? Well, memos started leaking out from NBC News. And one of the memos worried that Donahue would be, quote, a home for the liberal anti-war agenda at the same time that our competitors are waving the flag at every opportunity, unquote. That memo asserted that Donahue represents, quote, a difficult face for NBC News in a time of war. So Donahue primetime was canceled by MSNBC three weeks before the invasion of Iraq. And a few days before we were canceled, something weird happened. MSNBC announced that they were hiring someone new to host a new program. And the person they were hiring was the far right racist radio talk show host, Michael Savage. So think about that. This legend of television, Phil Donahue, was not an appropriate face for NBC News, but Michael Savage was. And I want to remind you, and this is my final comment, this was 50 years after, 5-0, 50 years after the rise of Senator Joe McCarthy and more than a decade after the Soviet Union collapsed. The Cold War was persisting in US news media and still does to this day. Thank you. And thanks for organizing this event. Thanks so much, Jeff. Thank you. Uh, Peter McLaren is a professor of education and critical studies at Chapman University here in Southern California. He is the author of many books on the topic of critical pedagogy and revolutionary politics, including the recent critical pedagogy and insurrection. Um, Peter, are you there? I'm there. Yeah. Can you hear me? All right. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thanks to Frank and Rachel and to Code Pink and everyone who made uh, this really a, a amazing and important event uh, possible. I'm going to be speaking um, primarily about liberation theology, uh, its birth, and the, the historical assault on liberation theology. Recognizing the historical alliances that the church had made with colonial powers and empires of pillage and plunder. Pope John Paul the 23rd through the 1962, actually to 65, Second Vatican, Second Vatican Council attempted to reclaim the early roots of the church, the church of the first 300 years before it was recognized by its critics as the persecuting church that had, among other things, infamously ignited the Crusades and the Spanish Inquisition and was complicit in helping Nazis escape to Latin America after World War II. The Conference of Latin American Bishops that was held in 1968 in Medellin, Colombia, marked the beginning of a seismic shift within the Catholic Church as it began to arc somewhat towards the left. And it was here that bishops from all over Latin America agreed that the church should take a specific stand, which, which they called a preferential option for the poor, while developing a catechism of liberation undergirded by the gospel teachings of Jesus so that the poor could, in effect, liberate themselves from the institutionalized violence of, po of poverty and capitalist exploitation. 
And the philosophy that underlay liberation theology, one that combined Christianity with a Marxist critique of political economy, had been drawn up at a meeting of Latin American theologians initiated by Gustavo Gutierrez in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil in 1964. Archbishop Helder Camara, who was famous for stating, when I give food to the poor, they call me a saint, but when I ask why they are poor, they call me a communist. He led 40 bishops late at night into the catacombs of Domatilia outside of Rome. And after celebrating the Eucharist, they signed a document under the title, The Pact of the Catacombs, challenging themselves and others to live lives of poverty and to dedicate themselves to serving the two thirds of humanity who live in poverty. So liberation theology became a powerful movement for social justice within the, within the Catholic Church throughout the 1970s and 1980s in brushing against the grain of traditional Catholic catechesis. For decades, the Catholic Church had been extremely adverse to social justice movements involving members of its ecclesiastical ranks, often associating such movements with communism. And this was made clear as early as the anti-communist encyclical, the Divini Redemptoris, written by Pope Pius XI in 1937, that formalized the Vatican's inevitable opposition against left-wing social movements, such as Dorothy Day's famous Catholic worker movement. Now, ironically, uh, today, uh, Dorothy Day has been named a servant of God by the Vatican and seems destined for sainthood. Um, so the persecution of priests who supported liberation theology became rampant in countries such as Brazil, Chile, El Salvador, Guatemala, Colombia, Honduras, and Nicaragua. A uh, storied educator, Paulo Freire, a Catholic, was thrown into prison in June 1964 for his support of teaching Campesino communities through the uh, practice of what came to be known as a pedagogy of the oppressed. Father Ernesto Cardenal, the Nicaraguan priest and poet who became the Sandinista Minister of Culture, famously remarked, for me, the four gospels are all equally communist. I'm a Marxist who believes in God, follows Christ, and is a revolutionary for the sake of his kingdom. It was interesting because I once sat beside Father Cardinal uh, on Hugo Chavez's TV show, Allo Presidente in Caracas, which what an amazing experience that was, uh, but that's for another time. Liberation theology gained international attention, attention after the government assassination of six Jesuit scholars, their housekeeper and their daughter on the 16th of November, 1989 on the campus of the Centro Americana University in, El, in San Salvador, El Salvador. These Jesuit priests were shot dead by soldiers because they had pushed for negotiations between the government and left-wing radicals. And prior to these horrific murders, which you know, made international headlines, the now canonized Archbishop Oscar Romero had been assassinated in 1980 while offering mass in the chapel of the Hospital of Divine Providence after famously speaking out against poverty, social injustice and torture and urging President Jimmy Carter to stop sending helicopter gunships to assist the Salvadorian military. Pope John Paul II was very much opposed to communism, obviously, and he considered liberation theology a dangerous development within the church. In the late 1970s, shortly after he was elected Pope, he began to oppose liberation theology directly and the church hierarchy moved decidedly to the right. It's been written that he gave cameo public endorsements for military dictatorships during visits to Argentina in 1982 and Chile in 1987. Okay. Early in the history of liberation theology, one of its most virulent opponents in North America, of course, was Ronald Reagan, who was intent on its utter destruction. As Noam Chomsky explains, and I quote, the United States, not content to sit back and watch an openly Marxist theology take hold in Latin America, a theology which threatened the US's economic and military do domination of the region, quickly moved to wipe out this emerging movement through violence. It did this through its strategic and logistical support of military dictatorships and its training of their death squads in the School of the Americas in Fort Benning, Georgia. As early as 1969, the Rockefeller Report identified liberation theology as a threat to the corporate interests and the security of the United States. Following this, the clandestine Operation Condor was put in place. Operation Condor was a major plan of inter-service and regional cooperation 
and a sharing of joint intelligence among the US and the right-wing dictatorships of the Southern Cone of South America, including Argentina, Chile, Uruguay, Paraguay, Bolivia, and Brazil, in order to maintain an intelligence sharing program of state terror and political repression. Well, the program actually began in 1968, but was fully implemented by 1975 and was responsible for as many or more than 60,000 deaths up until 1989. In Argentina alone, over 150 priests and nuns were killed, along with peasants, workers, intellectuals, and anyone associated with being part of or sympathetic towards leftist guerrilla movements or liberation theology. The program, which can be traced to the infamous School of the Americas, of course, renamed the Western Hemisphere Institute for Security Cooperation because of its historical association with the training of Latin American death squads, was created to advance joint counterinsurgency operations designed to eradicate communist subversives and ideas to suppress the influence of liberation theology in other oppositional political and or ideological positions. Through the Central Intelligence Agency, the military and the State Department, the US government helped to bring military dictatorships to power and secure their stability by imposing sanctions designed to destabilize the economies of socialist leaning regimes and by supporting and training, quote, black op and execution squads. While the USA was not an official member of the Condor Consortium, documents that were later uncovered revealed that during this time, the United States provided major organizational, financial, and technical assistance to the repressive regimes involved. The secret papers of the 17th Conference of the American armies in Mar del Plata in 1987 revealed that the US military initiated numerous discussions about how to wage socio-psychological warfare against liberation theology, ecclesi ecclesial and base communities through low intensity conflict strategies using misinformation and ideological subversion. So I agree with Norm Chomsky, who says that the US has often been bitterly opposed to Christianity and describes the attacks on liberation theology by the US administration as, quote, the first religious war of the 21st century. And then to conclude, after the election of Reagan, the Christian right became a dominant force in the Republican Party, of course, and in American politics in general, is Jerry Falwell and Christian leaders supported the, the, evangelistic, uh, the evangelization of, of, of Latin America. Uh, Basically, uh, Falwell said, I want you guys to get involved in politics and do missionary work in Latin America to counter left-wing Catholic teachers. That was one of a number of their, their goals. And during the 1980s, we see an amplification, of course, of anti-communism in the organizations, such as the Moral Majority, the Religious Roundtable, Focus on the Family, Free Congress Foundation, the Heritage Foundation, and the Christian Broadcasting Network. Thank you. They, thank you, Peter, for that very, very important um, testimony. It will be definitely put into the record. And I want to just say thank you, uh, Peter, for, for calling out or sounding out um, Gustavo Gutierrez. I was a university student in Peru at La Católica in the late 80s, and he was a professor there. And it was, everyone knew it was very special. So uh, everyone knew him. So thank you, uh, Presente. So Gail Walker is executive director or director of IFCO Pastors for Peace, and I will let her take it away. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and Frank and, and the whole team. What a tremendously rich and important event. I've learned a lot. Um, I'm just going to try to make this con uh, concise. I uh, wanted to follow up on uh, the role of the faith community in the fight against the Cold War. Uh, Peter's uh, uh, just his presentation, I think, was just so rich and so so powerful. Uh, too often, we know that the religious right has attempted to claim what it means to be a person of faith, but it has been my experience to see clergy that I respect, and for me, uh, especially Black clergy, um, case in point was the radical MLK that Jeff Cohen just referred to. Um, it's been my experience to see them step up to support movements and issues of concern to those of us fighting against injustice from the savagery of, uh, of uh, slavery to the vicious impact of Jim Crow, from the criminal legacy of police brutality to the campaigns of wicked barbarity waged by the US empire at home and abroad. 
and as Dr. Uh, Leah Gunning Francis, who wrote about the role of spirituality during the uprising in Ferguson, Missouri, following the murder of Michael Brown said, quote, being called to lead a faithful life can take us to places we never expected to go with people who never expected us to join hands with them. I just always feel that that's such a powerful statement. But liberation theology has historically been connected to the fight for uh, social justice as Peter was laying out in, in a world that it oppresses and as such is a tangible expression of what it means to work with God to embrace a future filled with hope is what it means to walk with God. So whether you identify as a person of faith or not, we all benefit from embracing hope. And I've been asked to just say a few words this evening about the legacy of my father, the late Reverend Lucius Walker, a visionary pastor of, for peace uh, who wore so many hats, but I just wanna speak briefly about his work with IFCO, the Interreligious Foundation for Community Organization. For the past 53 years, IFCO, much, much of it under the leadership of my father, has followed in that tradition of liberation theology. IFCO has organized and supported a variety of social justice issues and campaigns across the world associated with the historic and current Cold War. Uh, domestically uh, involved in the call for reparations, support of Native American uh, rights, farm labor organizers fighting injustice uh, of, um, for forced sterilization of women, calling for the brutality of the Klan, other white supremacists and modern day right wing extremists and standing up for political prisoners, uh, working on issues like hunger and homelessness and environmental racism. Internationally, if those work has involved campaigns supporting our brothers and sisters in Africa and Central America, Chiapas, Mexico, Cuba, Haiti, Palestine, Venezuela and more. Some of you know that IFCO's work to identify the hypocrisy of the so-called low intensity warfare in Central America is what led to the creation of a special project that my father labeled Pastors for Peace. And I was with him in 1988 when a passenger ferry carrying 200 Nicaraguan civilians and uh, an IFCO study delegation were attacked by US funded Contras who Ronald Reagan called quote, freedom fighters. Right. The attack started with individual gunfire, followed by automatic gun machine gun fire and then heavy artillery that violently shook the ferry boat from side to side. Uh, the weapons that the Contras used in that attack and the countless others uh, that the Nicaraguan civilian population were forced to endure throughout the Reagan era were all paid for with US tax dollars. And that attack resulted in the deaths of two people, um, dozens wounded, including my father. Uh, the first caravan, the first Pastors for Peace caravan returned to Nicaragua six months later on Christmas Eve with a busload of material aid for communities um, from communities in the United States where clergy and activists had stopped to educate US citizens about the reality of the brutal US foreign policy in the region. Um, our caravan served to illustrate an alternative people to people foreign policy model based on love and mutual respect. And since then, IFCO's continued to illustrate that commitment to social justice working alongside people of conscience and people of faith. So whether that faith be in our fellow human beings or in a particular religious belief, uh, we've worked together. We've organized dozens of caravans throughout Central America and the Caribbean embracing our commitment to fundamental social change, not charity. Uh, in short, it was my dad's belief that all people who struggled for justice were pastors. Uh, so at IFCO, we continue that work. We continue to work with all kinds of pastors for peace. And we continue to work because we believe that the foundation that he helped to build um, is really served as a blueprint for us to continue the important work of fighting for justice through action and education, encouraging us all to be shepherds for peace. And as he would call us to do time and time again, to step up and be real revolutionaries by practicing our faith. I think now we're gonna have courtesy of my dear friend, Rachel Brunke, uh, a beautiful but brief uh, video tribute to my father, the Reverend Lucius Walker, whose revolutionary spirit lives on. Thank you. Lucius Walker, founder of IFCO Pastors for Peace, was a highly effective and infectious thorn in the side of the U.S.'s hateful Cold War policies. 
While in Nicaragua in the 1980s, he was shot by Contra mercenary fire. He was inspired to begin solidarity caravans of aid to Central America, and later, after the fall of the Soviet Union, to Cuba as the United States tightened its economic blockade against the island nation. The caravans have been going ever since, and for decades crisscrossed the entire United States on an annual basis, countering the U.S. Cold War lies about Cuba and its importance to the world. Lucius was a bold and principled man of the cloth. He was a revolutionary thinker who never asked permission to build friendships between people or nations that the United States told us to fear and to hate. In fact, we should need permission to wage war, not permission to make peace. Love, he said, was the only license we needed to go to Cuba. Lucius Walker was a great visionary and a liberator of minds and hearts. He passed away in 2010, and to me he was our king in the Cuba Solidarity Movement. His profound work to bust through the U.S. Cold War blockade against Cuba is carried on today by his daughter, Gail Walker, director of IFCO. She is pictured here alongside American graduates of the Latin American School of Medicine in Havana, Cuba. They are now doctors, part of more than 150 Americans who have graduated along with tens of thousands of others from around the world from the Free Medical School. If you know of any young Americans under the age of 25 from economically disadvantaged backgrounds who have dreamed of becoming a doctor, please let them know about this opportunity and to contact IFCO, Pastors for Peace. Lucius Walker, presente. Presente. That's my gift to you, Gail. <laughs> John and Mai's gift to you. Um, thank you. Um, it, we're going to go into the couple of youth voices um, portion of this uh, program. And the first will be a TikTok video from uh, Emily Dorrell, who is running this show extraordinaire. And she is social media and communications director of Code Pink and Frank's uh, lovely daughter also. So yesterday's showdown at the Capitol was shocking, but it's important to remember that this, this violence, this is what the US government does to other countries all over the world. This, but worse. And they've been doing it for centuries. Within the past 30 years alone, the US government has violently intervened in over a dozen different countries. Iraq, Afghanistan, Venezuela, Haiti, Ecuador. I could go on. This is how the US treats other countries. We're just finally starting to get a taste. Ooh, watch out imperialism, here comes Emily. <laughs> Um, next up is my lovely daughter, um, Alma Brunke, and she is going to be speaking on the Pledge of Allegiance, God, and the U.S. Cold War. Um, she is youth coordinator at the Women's Journey Foundation here in Orange County. The controversial phrase, under God, was not always part of the Pledge of Allegiance. In the beginning of the U.S. Cold War, the United States passed a law that added the words under God to the pledge on June 14, 1954. It was a way to counter the idea of godless communism, a phrase that was used throughout the 1950s to alienate progressives from the rest of society. Many countries have an oath of allegiance, but the United States is one of the few to make it part of the primary education requirement. It's like a loyalty oath for kids. I am here to testify about what happened to me when I was in eighth grade in regards to the Pledge of Allegiance in schools and my First Amendment rights. So for a few weeks after starting eighth grade, I had stood for the pledge like all obedient American kids. Then I had heard about Colin Kaepernick kneeling to end the killing of black people. I'm biracial and because his demonstration was important to me, it led me to the idea to finally not stand for the pledge. When I started not standing, my teacher yelled at me and said, do you know what this looks like? It looks like you're not happy to be in this country. She said I wasn't grateful and that I was disloyal. I still didn't stand. 
my mom and I went to James Allen, publisher of the independent LA Harbor newspaper, Random Lengths News, and asked for help. What were my rights? He told, it, he told us that it was my right to not stand nor to say the pledge. In 1943, in West Virginia State Board of Education versus Barnett, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that students cannot be compelled to recite the Pledge of Allegiance, nor can they be punished for not doing so. We went back to my principal and my teacher with a copy of the Supreme Court case, and she never bothered me again. Thank you, Cold War Truth Commission, for allowing me to submit my testimony. Frank, you and I are very proud parents right now. Thank you. Um, next, we are going to have, uh, to round out our educational um, uh, perspective, we are going to have a taped testimony. It's quite wonderful from Marcy Winograd on the Cold War in the U.S. classroom. Marcy Winograd is the coordinator of Code Pink Congress and former congressional peace candidate. You can join her and co-host Medea Benjamin and Hanai Jodat Behrens each Tuesday night at 5 p.m. Pacific time for a Code Pink Congress Zoom on demilitarization and U.S. foreign policy. I'm Marcy Winograd and I want to thank Rachel Brunke and Frank Dorrell for this fantastic Cold War Truth Commission, a comprehensive look at the Cold War. Uh, uh, what we inherited during that time. And as a teacher with the, or retired teacher with the Los Angeles Unified School District, I'll be focusing on what it was like growing up as a student during the Cold War, as well as the red baiting of teachers throughout the country. I was born in 1953. This was several years after the US dropped atomic bombs on Japan, incinerating hundreds of thousands of people in a matter of days. 1953, the year I was born was also the year the CIA overthrew Mossadegh in Iran following his nationalization of the oil industry. So while I was growing up in my New York City apartment building towers out of blocks, Mossadegh was sitting in a prison cell in Iran for three years. Uh, after that, he was transferred and placed under house arrest at his home where he died quietly to avoid a political uprising over US criminality in Iran. In 1957, when I was four years old, the Soviet Union launched the first artificial satellite, Sputnik, into space. People here were like, how could this be? How could the Soviets have, how could Soviets have beaten us into space? This is terrible. Uh, we must crank up our science education. And that's what happened. Uh, Congress passed the National Defense Education Act, uh, which increased funding for education at all levels, particularly science. And they included low interest loans for college students, obviously not low enough. Uh, for students who went into science and technology. This focus on science and technology continues to this day, as we see with the proliferation of STEM programs in our high schools and colleges, STEM standing for science, technology, ed engineering, and mathematics. These programs are basically incubators for the military industrial complex. Uh, they groom students for jobs in weapons production and surveillance. And there is pushback on college campuses as well as at Code Pink, where I volunteer at Code Pink Congress. Let's flash back to 1962. This is when the Soviets in response to a US attempts to overthrow Castro in Cuba in the Bay of Pigs, installed nuclear missiles in Cuba, 90 miles off the coast of Florida. It was a tense 13 days. I was nine years old, I remember this. Rushing off to the grocery store and at this point in the San Fernando Valley with my mother, to stock up, um, we were frantically up and down, you know, running up and down the aisles, putting canned goods and other items in our grocery basket, thinking that we needed to hunker down to survive, to endure uh, a nuclear catastrophe. We know that now we know that this is this was crazy, right? But this this was what we were doing then. Uh, we did not have a bomb shelter, so I'm not sure where we were going to hunker down, uh, or or why people thought bomb shelters would protect them from radioactive fallout. But a lot of people were building bomb shelters in Los Angeles and throughout the country. Uh, the president was telling us, build a bomb shelter. It will, it will protect you. And people were hoarding food to put in these shelters. They didn't want people showing up in the middle of the night uh, asking to stay with them or uh, for a bite to eat because the grocery stores were empty. Years later, we recognized these fallout shelters were absurd and uh, a global nuclear disarmament movement followed and people looked at these fallout shelters and said, what are we, what are we gonna do with these? And they became wine cellars or just storage spaces. By this time, uh, by the 60s, 
Los Angeles had become the largest military aerospace complex in the world with companies like Lockheed and Hughes and McDonnell Douglas profiting off the arms race. In school, we practiced duck and cover drills, our teacher would say, drop, and we would drop and duck under our desks, all of us collectively in the classroom, I remember this, and we would put our hands over our head, over our neck, thinking this was going to somehow shield us from radioactive fallout. I can still hear the song, the uh, duck and cover song. I'm not gonna sing because I don't have much of a voice. But together with the song, we saw a little video uh, with Bert the Turtle, who in an effort to get away from this evil looking monkey who was dangling a lit firecracker, maybe supposed to be you know, symbolic of a nuclear weapon, uh, Bert would climb back into his shell. And that's what we were doing. We were climbing under our desks, ducking and covering. In the seventh grade, 1965, during the Vietnam War, my social studies teacher, who I revered, used to periodically pause in the middle of a lesson about the 13 colonies, a lesson that never included anything about the racism inherent in colonization or the pernicious effects of uh, gen genocide. Uh, he, would, he would pause his lesson and he would take his yardstick and he would walk over to the wall where he had a giant map of Southeast Asia. And he would say, this is where Vietnam is, and this is where we must win. We must win the Vietnam War because if we do not, then communists will creep up on our beaches in Santa Monica. They will invade our living rooms. The whole world will become a totalitarian dystopian nightmare ruled by autocrats. And truthfully, I believed him. I didn't know much about the Vietnam War. And it wasn't until later, you know, when I was in high school and my father, screamed sense into my sister's boyfriend who wanted to enlist to go to Vietnam and fight, that I realized that my history teacher was all wrong. And that propelled me into the anti-war movement. And I participated in moratoriums at UCLA. I marched in San Francisco. And by and large, my adult life has been a commitment to the anti-war movement. So getting back to my seventh grade class and the domino theory, the theory that he was espousing was that if one country went communist, all of the surrounding regional countries would go communist, thinking that it was monolithic uh, and it had nothing to do with class struggle or uh, revolutions about social injustice. No, that was not part of the thinking, at least not in that classroom. As a teacher applying for a job in 1993 with the Los Angeles Unified School District, I remember being taken aback because I was asked to sign a loyalty oath. Something to the effect of, I'm not a communist and I have no intention of overthrowing the US government. I signed. All of us were expected to sign this. If we didn't, we didn't get a job. These loyalty oaths, when did these, when did these pop up? Ah, during the Cold War, this was a pet project of the American Legion, together with the Daughters of the American Revolution and the Chambers of Commerce. They were pushing legislation across the country to adopt loyalty oaths and state by state. Uh, they were also promoting curriculum and uh, supporting anti-communist or communist hunting newspaper publishers like William Randolph Hearst, who was intent on weeding out the communist teachers in our academic institutions. During the Cold War, hundreds of teachers lost their jobs. They were forced out of teaching because they refused to testify before congressional committees, before HUAC, to name names about other teachers who might've been involved in organizing efforts. And where was the teachers union in all of this? Well, the AFT, the American Federation of Teachers, took a principal policy position in opposition, public opposition to these loyalty oaths and in opposition to requiring teachers to testify before these red baiting committees. There is controversy over how, uh, how committed to this position the teachers union was at the time, how strong it was. And others have pointed out that it was the ACLU that really fought to protect teachers who were accused of membership in the Communist Party. In addition to these loyalty oaths, as I briefly mentioned, the American Legion also pushed a curriculum which was um, adopted by some districts, but plenty of others rejected it. It included accepted literature, unaccepted literature. 
and also a mandate that was widely accepted. And that mandate was that if you were teaching in the United States in a public school, you better put up an American flag in your classroom. And you had better have your students recite the Pledge of Allegiance every day. And by and large, to this day, if you walk into a classroom in the United States, you will hear students reciting the Pledge of Allegiance, unless you happen to walk into a classroom like one that another person, somebody very close to me, uh, taught in, where no one was expected to recite the Pledge of Allegiance or to believe in nationalism. Thank you so much for your time today. And I know others uh, wanna share their views on the Cold War. And I appreciate everything that the organizers of this event are doing to bring out the truth and to fight the next Cold War. Thank you. Thanks, Marcy. Thanks, Rachel. It's my pleasure to now introduce Eric Mann. He, he's the host of Voices from the Front Lines, heard on KPFK FM 90.7 radio in Los Angeles here. He's a veteran of the Congress of Racial Equality and Students for a Democratic Society. And he's director of the Labor Community Strategy and co-chair of the Bus Riders Union. He's the author of Playbook for Progressives, The 16 Qualities of the Successful Organizer. Derek, you there? I hope so. Hi, everybody. Um, this is a deeply moving experience. Uh, you know, I was like most of you, I think, very active in some way in the United Front to defeat Donald Trump and to elect uh, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. Uh, it was a tremendous victory in what we would call United Front against fascism. But it was not a United Front against imperialism. And now we're faced rapidly with the Biden administration moving even in a more hawk-like fashion than the Trump administration. In fact, he ran on saying that Trump was soft on dictators from Venezuela to Russia to China. Uh, so we're now in a very difficult situation, which I think the Biden administration is trying essentially to integrate a multiracial imperialism to shore up some of the weaknesses of the present empire, but also carrying out the most extreme anti-Asian violence as we speak with uh, just recently, Anthony Blinken and Lloyd Austin and, and, and uh, uh, Biden have threatened China in the most fundamental way. Imagine that the Department of so-called Defense is involved in creating a new US power in the Pacific. Now, I come out of the tradition where the black movement and the anti-imperialist movement were both integral and that the black movement drove the anti-imperialist movement and vice versa. So the first thing that was important to understand is we believe that black people were a nation inside the United States, that Chicanos were a nation, indigenous people were an oppressed nation. We did not believe the United States was capitalist, but we believed it was imperialist. And therefore, when I joined the Congress of Racial Equality and SNCC, MFDP, there was all talk about black nationalism, black liberation, and therefore Vietnamese liberation and black liberation would be integral. The white movement was very important, Dr. Spock, uh, the great Daniel Ellsberg, but there's no question the black movement was the cutting edge and must be again of any successful anti-war, anti-imperialist movement. So it was SNCC that said, hell no, we won't go to Vietnam. It was Dr. King who said, the US is the greatest purveyor of violence in the world. It was Malcolm who said, we will not fight in Vietnam. It was Muhammad Ali who said, the Viet Cong never called me the N-word. Uh, it was John Carlos and Tommy Smith who raised their hands at an Olympic and basically said, we don't represent the United States. We represent the third world and a black nation. That's, and it was Fred Hampton and the Black Panthers, if you read the book, Blacks Against Empire. But that's a great story, but we have to see the other side of it. Dr. King was assassinated. Malcolm was assassinated. Fred Hampton was assassinated. SNCC was repressed. Every one of us was repressed. Paul Robeson was repressed. The Rosenbergs were murdered. So when the Rosenbergs simply said, 
we don't want to give nuclear weapons to the United States, but not also to the Soviet Union. They were murdered for being peace organizers. So the reason I say that is because the teaching cannot simply be an exposure to the Cold War, but has to be a challenge to each of us to answer the question, what are we willing to do about it? Which is what my life has always been about. So interestingly, in the real world, in the present, uh, brother, friend, Channing Martinez from the Labor Community Strategy Center, but running independently, he ran for the city council in the 10th district in Los Angeles, not even a majority black district anymore because of the genocide that the United States is carrying out against black people, including the liberal Democrats of Los Angeles, such as unfortunately Mayor Garcetti. But he ran on no police in the schools, no police on the MTA buses and trains. 50% of all new jobs must go to black applicants. Open borders for all immigrants. Free public transportation, no stop attack on black passengers, which in itself was phenomenally radical. But then he said, US hands off Venezuela, Russia, China, Iran, Iraq. And here's something important. The United States is not simply a ruling class. It's an imperialist country in which the majority of white people, in my opinion, are directly involved in national oppression. They're not simply confused by it, but they're active participants. And the effort of the United States through its armies, through its prisons, is trying to in, uh, organize everyone to be a pro-imperialist bloc. Now Channing got 5% of the vote. If you know anything about real elections, that's phenomenal for a first candidate. And he got 10% of the black vote. And what we say and what I teach is set the edge, split the room, and then move the room to you. And what we saw is when you're at a candidate's night talking about these issues intelligently and thoughtfully, people who are pro-imperialist start to move because the logic of the argument, the morality of the argument. So one reason they wanted to keep the communists out of the trade unions, keep the communists out of the schools is because even in the midst of all this institutional power, they can't win the damn argument. They have to keep us out because if you're good organizers and you know how to work with people, not pontificate, but communicate and listen, these are very compelling arguments, starting, of course, with Black people who have been enslaved and Indigenous people and Mexican people. So it's critical that the anti-imperialist movement be an integral part of the social reality of this country and not somewhat on the outside. Now, Michael Muirpool did a great job about books. I'm deeply moved by the book, The Jakarta Method, which is terrifying about what the United States did in Indonesia after the uh, Bandung Conference, by the way, in Indonesia. Then there's my book, Comrade George, An Investigation into the Life, Political Thought, and Assassination of George Jackson. It's another one of my books, and it's interesting, called Katrina's Legacy, The Black Nation and the People of the World Confront the U.S. imperialist white settler state and its genocidal climate crimes. I think we have to go beyond talking about white supremacy to talk about a white settler state as integral to the country that we're trying to change. And then there's my book, Playbook for Progressives, The 16 Qualities of the Successful Organizer, because if you're not an organizer, as um, Marcy Winograd is, you can't succeed. And I wanna end with a very encouraging story, which is uh, difficult. Uh, in September of 1969, I organized a demonstration against the Harvard Center for International Affairs. I had already been part of SDS at Columbia, where we took on the Institute for Defense Analyses. Uh, this was not a friendly demonstration. This was Henry Kissinger's Center for Death. We went in, we broke windows, we turned over our desks, we sprayed death to US imperialism, the black nation will rise. 
Ho, 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 Chi Minh, the young earth will go in the wind. And my good friend Howard Zinn said that was a very good nonviolent demonstration because no one was attacked except for us. However, I was sentenced to two years in prison for that demonstration and I served 18 months. Now, when I got into prison, four prisoners came up to me the first day I got there and said, Eric, we decided to become communists. I said, well, that's terrific. I didn't even get here yet. What led you to that conclusion? He said, well, you know, Charlie Kraft speaking for Jimmy Drummy and the others said, you know, I was in the cell and Joe, the screw, the guard said to me, hey, Charlie, we hate communists, right? And I said, yeah, we, we hate communists. He says, good, because there's a guy coming we got to hate. His name is Eric Mann and you're not gonna like him at all. First of all, he's for the blacks. And Charlie said, oh, is he black? No, I think he's one of those Jubies. You know, he's one of them, but he hates white people. Charlie said, wait, he, he likes black people, but he hates white people and he's a communist, right? He says, yeah. So we don't like him, right, Charlie? Charlie said, wait a minute. The person who's locking me up is telling me that I got to unite with him because we're both anti-communist. But if he's locking me up and he's anti-communist, then it must be logical that I must become a communist. And I'm going to tell all the other prisoners that apparently this guy coming in must be a real threat to them because the guards are trying to organize us. So I'd end by saying this. If you're Black, if you're Latino, Latinx, if you're Asian Pacific Islander, if you're indigenous, and yes, if you're white of conscience, and if the people who lock you up are pro-imperialist and anti-communist, wouldn't it be logical that you would become anti-imperialist and pro-communist? Because that's what I think you need to understand is this country is locking us up and at the same time, encouraging us to lock up the people all over the world. I believe we have a real chance to win. If you like this point of view, check me out at info at the It's an honor to be part of this conversation.